Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at the HP Pavilion 14. This is on the lower end of the price scale from HP, but a nice laptop nonetheless, and we're going to be taking a deep dive into how this laptop works in just a second. But I do want to let you know, in the interest of full disclosure, that this came in on loan from HP. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop is all about. Now the price point on our review loaner here is about $700, give or take. And there's a lot of different ways to configure this laptop. And the price of the laptop will vary, of course, based on the configuration options that you choose. Now the review loaner we got in has an i5 processor, an 1135G7. This is the new Tiger Lake chipset from Intel, and it also has the Iris XE graphics on board. And these are a really nice improvement over prior generation Intel devices. And in many cases, these Tiger Lake laptops actually do a pretty decent job playing games. Uh, these are not gaming laptops per se, but they can run games that laptops in this class couldn't run well a year ago. And they've made some real strides on the uh, graphics side here with these new Intel chips. Now, if you do want to play games on this, though, I would advise going up to the i7 version of it because the graphics on the i7 version are slightly more powerful than the i5, and you get a few more frames per second out of the games that you're looking to play on it versus the i5 version. So I would say the i5 is probably fine for photo editing and light video editing, but the i7 is probably where you want to go if you want to play some games casually on this thing. Again, no replacement for a gaming laptop, but they can play games, and in this generation of chips, the i7 is a little better than the i5 at that. Another thing to note is the memory. Now, this one has 8 gigabytes of RAM installed, but they also have a version with 12 gigs of RAM, and that would sound like a good kind of middle point between 8 and 16 to go with a 12 gig configuration, but we're finding with these Tiger Lake chipsets that they don't like uh, some of these odd memory configurations where the two RAM modules inside of the computer are not of an equal value. So, for example, this laptop has 8 gigs of RAM, and it's split up between two modules, 4 and 4. The 12 gig version has an 8 and a 4, and as such, it can't really uh, get the most out of the graphics performance with that configuration. So my advice on the RAM is either get an 8 gig version or a 16 gig version, but don't do the 12 gig, because you will see a graphical hit there, and we've been noticing that with another machine, again, powered by the same chipset. If you're still with me, this one has a 14 inch display, 1080p, there's three different display options available. You have an entry-level display that's only running at 720p, and you're going to see a really attractive entry price on this model. I wouldn't go with that display. I would make sure you go with at least the 1080p version. And then there are two brightness options on the display. So this one that I have on the review loaner is the brighter 400-nit display. It looks great. In fact, the brightness is turned down right now so we don't blow out the camera. But there's also a less expensive 1080p display running at 250 nits, which will be dimmer than what we've got here on the desk. And if you don't really need that bright of a display, the 250 should be fine. But if you really don't like dim displays, uh, the 400 here is the way to go. I do believe they also have a touch option available, but not in the brighter display. And yes, we've had a lot of explanation to do here on the configuration, but there are a lot of options, and it's good to know what to look for when you are shopping. And in many cases, retailers will get one version or the other. Uh, so just be advised as to what we just went through, and be careful when you're shopping to make sure you get the best configuration, because I really like the way they outfitted this one, and I think that's how you probably want to go with the one that you choose. And at a minimum, I would avoid the 12 gig configuration just because it won't perform at the moment the way that the 8 or the 16 gig one will do graphically. Now there's also a version of this laptop with an NVIDIA MX450 GPU that might give you a little bit of a graphical boost in certain areas, but it may not be enough compared to the i7 to warrant the uh, decrease in battery life you might experience with that separate GPU on board. So I would probably, again, stick to the i7 version of this if you're looking for a good graphical performance with decent battery life, but there is a GPU option if you need that for your specific application. This one has 256 gigabytes of NVMe SSD storage on board. You can upgrade the storage and you can upgrade the RAM on it. 
if you want. So you do have, again, a lot of configuration options here, and that's always good to have a few different ways you can configure one of these computers to find the best price and performance ratio that works for you. As for ports, we've got a bunch of them on here. Let's take a look at the left-hand side first. Uh, we have a headphone microphone jack here along with a USB 3 port for connecting up devices. On the other side, we have a micro SD card slot so you can plug your camera cards in there. You have a USB Type-C port here. Uh, this is a full service port, so this can charge the laptop. It can send display out to a monitor. And of course, you can have data devices going in and out. There are a lot of great little docking stations that you can buy that will plug right into this and give you a single cable to do all of those things if you want to do that and kind of turn it into a little desktop. You have a USB 3 port here. You've got a full-size HDMI output and you have the power adapter that can go in here. So you can power the laptop either through its included adapter or through the USB Type-C port, all very convenient. The weight on this one is 3.4 pounds or 1.54 kilograms. It's a mixture of metal and plastic. It feels pretty nice for a low cost laptop here. Uh, the uh, keyboard will kick up on you as you're lifting up the display, but otherwise it feels pretty well balanced and the display goes to about here. So this is not a two-in-one but they do have, of course, their X360s, which will work as tablets. But for a laptop, it feels pretty nice and pretty nicely built. Now, on the keyboard here, it's backlit on some versions, so you have that available to you. The uh, white backlight will kick on when you are in a darker environment. Uh, nice trackpad here. It's a decent size, tracks pretty well. No issues with either the keyboard or trackpad. And you also have a fingerprint reader on certain versions as well for opening up and getting into Windows a little bit quicker than having to type in your password. Now it does of course have a webcam here at the top. It is 720p, so not the best quality out there, but it does have a pretty wide angle to it, at least compared to some other laptops in its class. So you can see I could easily fit two or three more people around me for a family Zoom call or something like that. It'll certainly work well for video conferencing, given that it's got a decent Intel processor inside. Battery life on this, I estimate between seven and eight hours doing the basics. You'll want to keep the display brightness down a bit, especially if you have the 400 nit display. But it's passable and it will charge up pretty quickly when you do plug it into power. The speakers here actually surprise me. They're on the bottom and I'm typically not a big fan of these downward firing speakers. But these actually kind of project out to the side. And I think there's a bit of room here to enhance the sound a bit inside of the case. So I was pleased with the sound quality. You don't get a lot of bass out of the speakers, but they do have a good range of sound, really nice stereo separation, and it doesn't sound muffled, even though uh, they are on the bottom portion of the laptop. You have an air intake here at the bottom that you're going to want to keep clear because it does have a fan on board. Uh, the fan does not kick on often, but if you are doing uh, things that really tax the processor like gaming or some video processing or something, that of course will kick that fan on. It's not all that noisy, it's about on par with other laptops of its size, but just know there is a fan on this that will kick on when the computer is placed under heavy load. Let's take a look now and see how it performs. We'll begin with some web browsing and work our way from there. All right, let's boot up Google Chrome here and see how it performs. Now, when you're shopping for this, there are two Wi-Fi options. One is a standard AC Wi-Fi. There's also a Wi-Fi 6 version that'll be a little faster if you have a Wi-Fi 6 router. I have an AC router here at the house, so nothing fancy, but it seems to be working just fine for web browsing and some of the other basics that you might do uh, on a laptop like this. So I anticipate no issues with email and word processing and spreadsheets and all that good stuff. Uh, we also checked out YouTube a little bit earlier. We ran a 1080p 60 frames per second video from my YouTube channel, and we didn't have any drop frames or other concerns with its performance on video playback, so it should be fine for doing Netflix and uh, Twitch and all the other services that you might stream to your laptop. So altogether, it performs as we expected it to doing the basics. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test, we got a score of 259.4 on version 1.0 of that test and 129 on version 2.0. And that comes in right where I expected it to, a little bit better than the i5 chip from the prior generation, but on par with what we're seeing out of chips from this generation. And all in, it performs the way I expected it to do. So let's move on now to gaming. And we've got Grand Theft Auto 5 here running at 1080p at the lowest settings. 
Uh, we did notice that it would hiccup every once in a while, like you just saw there, a little bit of lag here and there. It was doing it on this game and a few others that we were playing at this resolution. I think you'll have a better go at 720p with this game and many other AAA titles on the i5 hardware. And as we've seen in reviews of the i7 variant of this chip, you do a little bit better with that one versus the i5, given that it has more GPU cores available. If we take a look now at The Witcher 3, uh, this is running at 1080p lowest settings, and you can see we had another little hiccup there and about 30 frames per second, give or take, uh, playing the game here. Not bad, but I think you might want to go to 720p, which we will do right now, and as you can see, the game is running much better at that lower resolution. So I think 720p is kind of the sweet spot uh, for the i5 variant for the best performance, especially with some of these newer, more demanding games. Uh, we also ran Fortnite at 1080p. There we were doing a little bit better between 40 and 70 frames per second. But again, this is another game that I think might do better at 720p on this variant, because as you can see, we're getting a few little hiccups in the graphics there as it's loading in uh, new textures and other things there. We might see this improve as drivers improve from Intel. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 1,111. And that puts this one, on paper at least, a little bit above the Ryzen 5 4500U that we uh, looked at on both the Lenovo Flex 5 and the HP Envy X360. Although I do recall the gameplay experience being slightly better on those AMD Ryzen's, and that again could be some driver issues that Intel has to work through on the new platform here. Now if you're curious how the i7 might do in comparison, well check out the Dell XPS 13 we reviewed a few weeks ago. Uh, that one of course costs a lot more than this one does, but it has that i7 1165G7 processor. And you can see there is a pretty noticeable increase in graphical performance on those two graphics tests versus the i5 we have in this machine. So that, again, is a good argument for looking at the i7 when you're out shopping for this laptop, especially for playing games. Now, on its temperature, did a very good job here on the 3D Mark stress test. We got a passing grade of 98.1%. Uh, that means we shouldn't see all that much thermal throttling when the computer is placed under heavy load. And you can also see what the temperatures are there of the CPU when that stress test concluded. All right, one last thing to take a look at here, and that is Linux compatibility. We've got Ubuntu 20.10 booted up. Video is good, Wi-Fi is good, Bluetooth and audio are all good, and I think you'll have a pretty good Linux experience with this machine. It seems to be pretty compatible across the board, so no issues here. Uh, so altogether, I think it's a pretty nice little machine from HP. I like the form factor. I like that they're keeping the screen sizes the same and making these laptops smaller over time. So if you want something that's nice and has a good processor inside that doesn't break the bank, this is definitely something to consider. Just make sure you get the right configuration. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.